Hello everybody, I'm Lorenzo Marchese and I'm here right at the beginning of this video we're about to watch to remind you to subscribe to my channel. Um, it's very helpful if you do and also please tell your friends, uh, your family members and share it if you can. Um, love to hear your comments and feedback, uh, but just want to make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Geek Authority. I'm your host, Lorenzo Marchese, and this is the show where, yes, I talk to all kinds of people, actors, writers, directors, producers, uh, cosplayers, uh, musicians, all kinds of, uh, of things. Today, I've got an extra special guest and why um, this particular uh, gentleman actually lo loves the same things I do, and particularly this, this show that I'm wearing called Sequest DSV, and that's what we're going to talk about because he has his own website dedicated to that series, and we're going to talk about that as well. Please welcome uh, Martin Lakin. Thank you so much for coming. Well, good evening, Lorenzo from the UK. Are you well? I, I'm very well. Yeah, that's right. Let's let everyone know that as we're recording this, it's morning for me here in uh, Los Angeles, California. And what time is it? Where are you at? It's, uh, it's 7 p.m. and freezing cold in the UK. You wouldn't want to be here. Wow. Wow. Anyway, thank you so much for doing this. Okay, our subject today today is Sequest, and a um, couple of initial questions. Um, when did you first see the series, um, and what was intriguing about it when you were watching? Well, first of all, um, in the UK particularly, uh, it's uh, it's it's amazing that there are any Sequest fans at all because the series was treated appallingly in this country. Um, I first read about it in the newspaper, and the first the words I read were Steven Spielberg once again collaborates with Roy Scheider to make a sci-fi series. And as a sci-fi fan all my life, you you have to understand that you know that was just like that was like reading that Elvis had, had, had been reincarnated. It was incredible. And so the anticipation for that was, for me personally, was off the charts. Um, but then I think it premiered in the US. And then by the time it got to the UK, I think Advanced Word had kind of uh, done its work. And the, uh, the central region where I'm from, uh, they kind of treated it as a bit of a joke. I remember the, uh, the trailers for it. Um, and the opening for the trailers uh, had uh, the, a shot of Roy Scheider from the pilot. And it, I think that the narration was something along the lines of uh, just when this man thought it was safe to go back in the water. You know, all that, all that Jaws tube nonsense. And um, I th they, they showed the majority of the first season on Saturdays, I think at a terrible time slot. Uh, and they just stopped. They stopped broadcasting it before the first season was over. Um, and then I don't think we even got, I think we got season three. I think we got sequence 2032 before we even got season two in this country. So the reason that it didn't build up a fan base in the UK, especially is because nobody knew up or down which way this was going because there was the continuity was shot. We had no, no clue. Um, so for people like me that, you know, from the, from the outset, just adored the show. I mean, from the from the very opening moments, you know, with with the credits and the music, you know, John Debney's theme, so engaging. From that point on, I was totally captivated. So it could do no wrong in my eyes. I, I didn't know whether the rest of the world what wasn't with me in thinking that this was, you know, television heaven. Because for me, it, it was what I enjoyed about it. I think most in the beginning was it was very feature like, especially the pilot. I mean, directed by Irving Kirshner, no less. I mean, starring Roy Scheider. Director, director of The Empire Strikes Back, the second of the original. Director of The Empire Strikes Trilogy. Back. So, so the, with, the, with that kind of pedigree involved. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'm curious. Do you guys have ratings in, in the UK like we do? Uh, we do. I don't know what system they use. Um, okay. And it's not, that, it's not, it's not given the, the same kind of emphasis that Nielsen ratings over there, I believe that's what they're called, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Nielsen, given but, here. 
But the first season of Sequest out here got great ratings, hence its renewal, because we they don't renew anything unless people are watching. Um, right. Especially a show that costs a million and a half an episode back in 1994. Yep. So. Yeah, it was a phenomenal amount of money. Um, I think we had uh, we had Lois and we had the same trouble here with ratings because Lois and Clark was on uh, BBC One at the same time, so it competed with that. And uh, as I say, Advance Word kind of killed it in advance, really. Did you like Lois and Clark, Gary? You see, I'm my other passion is the Christopher Reeve Superman movies, and so I consider anything else a slap in the face, really. Okay, <laughs> with that see, franchise, gonna, gonna, I can't be, I can't bear it. <laughs> I'm going to disagree only because they brought the humanity and the the love interest, the whole cat and mouse thing with Lois and Clark, and I think that's what they were going for. I ultimately, you know, obviously Christopher Reeve is my favorite Superman. Can't stand Henry Cavill. No offense to the UK, but or, he's from England, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, I don't know why we're hiring a lot of English actor, actors to play superheroes, but, yeah. you know, it's uh, just, Christopher Reeve was just, it for me. Yeah, um, by by the way, moment. do you get Supergirl in London or England? The show, the current yeah. show. Yes. Okay. Um, do you know there's yeah. a spinoff of Supergirl called, what's it called? Clark and Lois? I don't know. They're, oh, they're, the... The new show, the one yeah. with uh, Tyler Hoechlin or whatever his name is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, again, I will, I mean, okay, I'm a zealot when it comes to uh, Superman material, but I will watch everything. I will give everything an absolute chance. I mean, I say about Lois and Clark, I, I adore Terry Hatcher. She was fantastic. Um, I, right. <laughs> well, I couldn't take, I, I struggle with Dean Cain. I couldn't take him seriously. He's um, nice. Oh sure, I've I've met him. Yeah, he's he's a nice guy. He does um he does a lot of cons, and so he's shown up in the UK on numerous occasions, and he and he makes everybody's day. Um, so yeah, in in that uh, in that sense, he's wonderful. But yeah, don't get me started on Superman. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, let's get back to sequence. Okay, all right. So since we since since you know you obviously like sci-fi shows, and you caught uh, Sequest, sure. although you caught half of it, and then they turned it off, and then they brought the third season. To me, yeah. that would be I'd be writing, but. That's yep. just me. Um, mm. So what about uh, what about the um, this is 1994 for us. Yep. yep. Did you get it the year the same year or the year later? Yes. Or what? No, no. We got the same year. OK. Uh, the reason I asked that is because like way back when Doctor Who was the original cast, we used to get like whoever the doctor was and their season a year yep. later. So yes. it was like you have the new doctor and we'd be like, I have to wait a year. And it's, yeah. Anyway. So I was wondering if they did the same thing for, didn't for you, our show. Didn't you, have a, didn't you have a channel called PBS devoted to Doctor Who? Yes, that's, that's where I first yeah. met. My doctor's number five, Peter Davison. That's the right. first one I saw. Um, okay. But of course, Russell T. Davies relaunched it in 2005. Anyway, again, we're off subject. So uh, here we go. So let's, let's get back to, uh, let's talk about this. Uh, let's start, uh, where do we start? Let's start here. Um, now the um, I'm I was I'm actually reading a book right now on uh, printed in 1994 I believe, um, and it's so rare I, I don't think it's ever it's out there anymore. But it was telling me they, there's a lot of uh, painstaking creativeness went into the, like the logo design um, yep. and choosing the the uh, hammerhead shark and so on and so forth. Um, yep. What do you think of what do you think of the graphics? I think they are incredible. I mean, it again. I mean. I, it's everywhere. Look around me. Um, this particular uh, style, um, all of the uh, the guy that designed the titles plus was the guy that designed most of the ships. Is a graphic artist called James Limer, um, and James Lima or Limer, however you pronounce it, uh, yeah. was responsible for all of these incredible designs. He designed the Sequest submarine itself. He designed the Stinger. Um, he designed the bridge, the interiors, and he designed this uh, this fabulous logo with, uh, as you say correctly, the uh, the hammerhead shark dissecting the queue. Um, I think the font he actually named it Lima Oblique back in the day. Um, ah, all of this has okay. been kind of lost to history, really. But uh, yeah, I mean, I sp I've been trying to get in touch with uh, James Lima, but um, he's um, he's out there in the ether somewhere. I'd love to speak to him about uh, his designs because I think that his designs hold up today probably even better than they did back then i think Absolutely. the series was yeah the series took place in tw the year 2018 as we know and they you know 
the nautical theme that he incorporated into all of his designs. I mean, the Sequest submarine especially, what an incredible design that is. It looks like nothing else to this day. It doesn't look like a spaceship. Yeah, and, like. and let me tell you from personal experience, having um, seen it, I haven't worked on the show, but I was, I think I was working on Quantum Leap at the time, but the sets were incredible. It included a live pool. It had a, a, a real water tube uh, thorough way, I guess is the way you call it, for the actual Darwin uh, dolphin, as well as a mechanical dolphin, um, which they had a lot of problems with. And let me yep. tell you, it was it was just an incredible set, very detailed, quite yep. unlike a submarine that you would actually see today, like a real submarine. Um, and it had, I believe, 32 screens, like they had to feed video to while they're shooting the scenes of various displays and things that were going on, depending on the episode. So, right. Um, yeah. Let's Oh, let's talk about the cast real quick. Um, I don't think they could have done better at all than Roy Scheider. Um, no. And no. as a leader, as an actor, as a performer, he gave the show gravitas. He gave the show believability because he got angry when, when as a viewer, when you're watching, when, when you would get angry and reacted. Um, I, I loved his relationship with uh, um, um, Wallencheck and, of course, with the doctor. I, I, I wish they would have pushed that a little more. But yep. uh, what do you think? Uh, I mean, Chida. I've, I've I've been a fan of his obviously since Jaws. But I mean, my one of my favourite films is Blue Thunder, okay. and uh, I just adore him in that. And so you know, the idea all these years later, when the critics said, "Oh, you know, twenty years ago Spielberg, uh, Chida asked for a bigger boat, and twenty years later Spielberg gave him one," it, it was just it was all so perfect. I mean, you could tell that it was written for him. The whole show was designed around him. And he really rose to the occasion because, you know, if, if we watch the pilot now, I love all the stuff where he's, he's out there and he's kind of playing Robinson Crusoe and all he, he's just got, just him, his island, his dolphin. I mean, they, the recent Picard series kind of plagiarized that something, something terrible by ha having him in a similar fashion. But um, yeah, so, you know, and then bringing him aboard, reluctantly aboard this ship, um, only to end up uh, captaining it the way that it was always destined. What a premise for a series! So um, you know, you, you show up to NBC with this on paper, and you say, "Look, we've already we've already got Roy, we've got um, Rockney S. O'Bannon who uh, created Alien Nation, he's written it, Spielberg executive producing. What more do you leave? I mean, it's the ultimate mic drop moment, isn't it? You just throw the uh, the, the series bible over and you walk away and you say, I'll, "I'll see you when you you give me one point uh, one point five million per, per episode." We'll talk again then. So yeah, I mean, the rest of the cast, wonderful people. Did you did um, you know him? Like like uh, Stacey Haddock down there was she was on Superboy. Ted Raimi was Ted Raimi's got a famous brother as well as he's done hundreds of movies, including the yep. Spider Man series. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Royce B. Applegate, is that his name? That's um, the same. Yeah, he he was funny. I loved his little, uh, you know, relationship with uh, Roy and how they obviously had a past and yes. knew, knew each other well. What was your What was your yeah. favorite relationship? Did you? A lot of people didn't like the, well, the kid because he was like the super genius. Um, Oh yeah, no. I, I think um, I really like Lucas. I, I mean, I thought the, his portrayal as somebody that uh, somebody was misunderstood, as opposed to the whole Wesley Crusher thing, I, I, and somebody that was just kind of basically a stowaway and there to make good. Um, I thought that Brandy's played that incredibly well. You know, I I don't think late, the late I don't think there are any fault. The late Jonathan Brandis, God rest his soul. I don't think there's a there was a false step in his performance at all. I completely bought his his journey, if you like. And uh, if you watch the series from start to finish, all, all the way through, I mean, Lucas's journey is probably the one of the most significant ones that, uh, aside from Don Franklin, of course, who uh, who is in every episode. I think he's one of the only actors besides Ted Raimi that is that does feature in every in every show. Um, right. It's as much about his journey as it is uh, as it is Shadow and everybody else. I should probably point out actually that Stephanie Beecham, uh, who played uh, Doctor Westphalen, she's a national treasure here. I mean, we adore her in the UK. Um, she's been in so many things uh, over here uh, that I mean, I, I think you guys know her. Did she do Falcon Crest or, or something like that? There, she did Falcon Crest. She was on Star Trek: Next Generation. She's done she's done all kinds of fun stuff. So yeah, she's she's wonderful. She's she's really really held know, in and, high regard here. And you know, Marcos, the one on, on top up there, he uh he was in uh, Star Trek 2009, JJ Abrams. Yes, 
Marco Sanchez. Yeah. So all of these guys, I mean, they all have kind of a genre background anyway. So as you say, it's, uh, Stacey was in Superboy and um, with Ted and, you know, so there were all there was all a familiarity about all these these guys already. So to see them brought together as an ensemble around Shida was was wonderful. Absolutely, I, I love the first season. I loved it. Then we come uh, to season two. They made some some casting choices, um, mm-hmm. some good ones. Some uh, I don't I don't know if I would have gone that route, but um, here they are. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite additions is of course Dagwood. I think the fact that both real life brothers. We're on the show. Um, where's the other guy? Um, Michael. Michael. Yep, Deloise and, uh, at the end. Deloise and uh, Peter Deloise were on the show. I thought I thought Michael's character was amazing in terms of the, the antagonist, in terms of he always caused trouble and you got to put him in line. And I think Roy Scheider really liked playing that, you know, what do you call it? Uh, mentor to him. Um, right. Not so much yeah, someone, the he, blonde guy. The, what's who's the guy next to Schreider there? Oh, Brody. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, Lieutenant Brody. Yeah, I think he was um, brought for the looks. <laughs> yeah, well, the the whole of the season two cast changes were a result of. I mean, when we look back on it now, it's it's so sad. I mean, I'm, I, there are still fans to this day that are upset about the fact that uh, Beecham and Hayduck uh, didn't go down to Florida and continue. I mean, their, their losses are really felt, I thought, in the second Absolutely. season. Um, well, I mean, the second season gets a, a really, really bad uh, rap. Um, I find it entertaining, not in anywhere near as good in terms of quality as the first season, uh, story-wise. Um, I think the production design by Vaughn Edwards was superb. I love the fact that they're relocated to Florida. Made perfect sense to me. I mean, all the sets... Yeah, the, but in the in the show, they don't really point that out. They don't say, you know, we're no longer, you know, supposedly on the West Coast, we moved to the East Coast. You know right. why they did that, right? They did that for financial reasons. And yeah. Roy had a big problem with the 1994 earthquake. So, um, oh, I didn't was, know that. What? Oh, yeah. What was his because, problem with that? Um, it's just he wanted to move his family out of earthquake territory. It's not like we have uh, them every day. Um, right. And it was one of part of his contract was to, you know, um, to say, hey, you know, it's it's it was cheaper there, too, because uh, yes. uh, um, Universal had just opened their production studio. They had the theme park, but they didn't have a working studio until the right. end of Superboy. And then the start of this series was the first, you know, yeah. long run series. So, yeah. Um, well, what, what, did, do, what did you think of Touchy Feely Girl? I forget her name. Oh, in the center. Yeah, um, no, 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 the so, psychic. Um, oh, Doctor Smith. Yes, Doctor Smith. I um, she was no. I mean, there, there's a recent interview with. Uh, uh, they used to call her Doctor Crestfallen on set. Stephanie Beecham. Though in a recent interview, Stephanie Beecham said that you know they always referred to her as Doctor Crestfallen because she was always bringing bringing everything down. She was kind of the cynic of the whole thing. But you know that that's a British uh, British streak that I missed. And so when she was replaced by the character of Dr. Smith, who was sexy and perky and fun and games, but it wasn't kind of, I didn't buy the love story the same as I did. I mean, people were rooting. I mean, there was fan fiction back in the day about uh, getting Westphalen together with Bridger, justifiably. But, you know, the whole Dr. Smith thing was a little bit uncomfortable. I mean, Roy was too old by then to really kind of be involved with somebody that age. I mean, it was, it was made plain in the series that, you know, he, he had... Uh, he had something going on with, with her mom. So it was all kind of a bit, I don't know what they were thinking basically, but the same could be said about a lot of the writing for season two. It just kind of went on a huge tangent. It was beautiful to look at. I don't think did they you, made it. Did, did you like the whole alien storyline? No. Um, Mark I, Hamill? Mark Hamill? No. Well, that was, a, a, of course, I mean, the guest stars, they had something else. I mean, Charlton Heston, William Shatner, Topol. And, and by the time you get round to Mark Hamill, it's like, you know, a fabulous roster of them. I think they, if they were going to do Aliens, I think they did it best in the episode um, Such Great Patience, where they get the, the, the visit the first time. Right. Um, and it's completely by accident. And, you know, the, the way that they deal with, you know, the, I'd like to think if, the, you know, if Aliens were to show up on, on your boat, that that's the kind of way that you would deal with this. You know, your, your captain would be smart enough to say, on behalf of everybody in the world, 
we welcome you. <laughs> you know, you, you don't want to engage in anything uh, more sinister than that. And so again, it's Scheider. He makes these things work because, you know, he did 2010. He's used to all these massive, you know, unearthly situations. And the the, the thing that we've, we've always bought about him as an everyman is the fact that he just brings everything down to a, right. to a human level, to a relatable level. Right. For me, for me, he makes it real. I mean, you mentioned 2010 yeah. A Space Odyssey, which was the sequel to 2001, the original Stanley Kubrick, which didn't get great reviews, but he was wonderful. Him and John awesome. Lithgow were wonderful. Yeah. Um, the other thing, too, you had mentioned is the guest stars. This show, for those of you people who've never watched it, you know, William Shatner, Captain Kirk was there. Um, uh, who else did you mention? Um, Charlton Heston. He Charles created Heston. a... He created uh, people who could breathe underwater. He was a yep. scientist, and and who else? Hands out. Uh, we had uh, you had Shatner, Heston, Mark Hamill, as you say. Oh, Mark um, Hamill, that's right. Luke we Skywalker. Had top, we had Topol from Flash Gordon. He played oh. a terrific part in that in that uh, episode. And Topol from my favorite Bond film, because I'm a Roger Moore fan. Um, right. For for your eyes only. For your so. eyes only. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, and then. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> this one I have to, you know, swallow a little. <laughs> Sequest 2032 um, and the new cast. Let me enlarge this a little. Um, I like Michael Ironside. I liked him. I, he plays a lot of villains, but I yeah. think one of my, my favorite roles of Michael's was uh, V. He was a regular on V, the series. Yes, wow. Ham Tyler. What a great character he was. We so, were. again, it was a, again, you, you could see where they were going, the producers. It was like, well, who's another kind of solid genre veteran that would appeal to the kind of audiences? And the kind of audiences were back then were, were me and you. Um, you know, so, <laughs> a little younger. Like, <laughs> a lot younger. But you know, <laughs> some, somebody that would be instantly recognizable as somebody that's no nonsense. And as you say, he played villains for uh, the majority of his career. So, to have somebody like him come over. Um, do, you remember, you know, do you remember Scanners? Oh, that was the first thing I saw him in. Um, that's, that's a while ago. <laughs> he's a baddie. He's a good baddie. He's a, he's a, bad, he's a very good baddie. But, you know, he, I, I never got past the fact that uh, Scheider left his own show. I, could, I couldn't get to grips with that. I mean, when you, when you look at all the news articles from the day about how the season two changes had, had kind of been had such a terrible, a devastating effect on it. Um, the fact that he was kind of the author of the show's demise in season two, because whether he was misquoted or whether uh, it was sensationalized or not, the fact of the matter is that his comments did kind of finish the, the show off in terms of uh, its longevity. Um, I still got to get to the bottom of this story. I mean, there are people out there that know the story better than I do, but his comments to the Orlando Sentinel newspaper uh, back in the day, to say that the show was childish uh, trash, um, wow! You, you couldn't you couldn't rescind that. And you even know, though, I did, uh, you got to remember, in the third season, uh, Roy came back for like one or two episodes, and I yeah. like their I like the respect his character gave. You know, it's your boat. It's your boat. Remember, it's your yes. boat. Yes, I did. I yes. did like that. They honored yeah. that. They did. They huh. did. I mean, I mean. His appearances were contractual, as far as I could tell, because he just kind of, I don't think he could go back after that. According to the sources that I've got, apparently he went on the set the following day after that article had been published and apologized to everybody, all the production team, and said, look, this is, I know I've done some damage here, but, you know, it's, it's gone too far and I apologize for that. But so I, I think his position was kind of untenable by the time he got to the end of season two. It wasn't going his way. The writing had let him down. And so there was nothing left to kind of salvage by the time he got to 2032. Hey, what do you think about them destroying the ship twice? <laughs> uh, it's kind of... <laughs> I mean, can you imagine like watching Star Trek season one, blow up the Enterprise. Season two, blow up the Enterprise. <laughs> yeah. Like... I remember it was just kind of a stock thing to do by then. It was kind of stunt, uh, stunt I I dramatics. But story-wise, they didn't need to do that at all. They didn't need to do that at all. I remember... it. it it had its desired effect in Star Trek three when they blew up the Enterprise the first time. That was a right. shocker. You know, that I remember the whole cinema, but, you know, in tears. But, but but that was for a reason, that was for a cause, that oh. was that, that was purposeful. And they oh. got a new ship out of it. So <laughs> Yeah. That whole scene where uh, they're on the bridge and it's counting down. I mean, what stunning drama there. I mean, that's what you do it. As it as Leonard it turns Nimoy. out. Leonard Nimoy. Yes, God rest him. 
So, so many of these wonderful people have passed. I mean, obviously, Roy, we've lost uh, Royce the Apoke, and obviously we've lost Jonathan Brandis. It's absolutely tragic. Um, it's it's so sad, really, that, you know... It's funny you mentioned Jonathan Brandis, and he was at the height of his teen career. He was on posters and magazines, and, and he was like yeah. the hot, hot thing. So he was. he was undeniably a massive uh, teen heartthrob. But I think, you know, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a terrible affliction that he had, but... Had he have you know stuck it out, and had he have been around today, I think he would he'd be he'd be huge. He'd be enjoying the the biggest revival, you know, Karate Kid style more than well, more than likely. Let's hope so. People get famous when they're young, tend to go different routes in America, sure. and yeah. we don't know. But let's hope he had good parents or whatever. Okay, yes. so um, what do you think of Darwin? One of my favorite characters. Darwin, Darwin. Now he's a really interesting subject because still to this day people don't realize that Darwin was an animatronic. They thought he was a real dolphin. That is, that is testimony enough, I think, to all the people involved in his in his creation and operation. Because I think Darwin was was fabulous, and I think he was underutilized. I don't really think that originally they knew what to do with him. Rockney Esoban, and I think there was some debate in the very early stages of, of the series creation about making him more Spock like. So whenever he spoke. Um, his uh, his replies to some messages would be a bit more abstract, and uh, you could read a lot more into them rather than Darwin go catch fish, which is what we ended up with. Um, right. And so I think that that he was going to kind of be a, a, a next level kind of stage in our evolution, where what he, the kind of things he would say, we, we right. could, you could read all sorts of stuff into them. And I think they missed out on a trick there. I think that would have been really good. They could have just it could have just as easily thrown you know Bridger loves Darwin and all that business into it as well right and uh, i don't know if the audience realizes um the uh a lot of the exterior of the uh well i should say most of the exterior of the sequest and the action that took place were at the time in 1994 cg which back then i remember thinking oh my god this is so cool and you know of course it doesn't compare to like avatar and the stuff we have now titanic and all that but but i remember that I remember that because at the time this came out, the video games came out, the Sequest video games, Atari, Sega, the whole right. bit. Yeah. And they were kind of primitive in terms of what we've got today as well. But to see it on the TV and, and it looked really good. And, and I'd say 80% of Darwin was uh, CG outside of the ship. Um, uh, the other 10, 20, 10, 15% was the, uh, the actual shot at the lake. They have a lake over here in California, and then of course right. in Florida, it, it's all covered, it's surrounded by water. So there's yeah. a lot of places where they shot an actual dolphin. So um, yeah, well, um, on my website, I've interviewed a gentleman called Fred Tepper, and he was responsible for a lot of the uh, the VFX back in the day. And if you could if you could see what they what they work with these Amiga uh, toasters, I think they were called. Toasters, it's yeah. Abs absolutely shocking technology compared i mean for what they managed to get out there i mean i love right. the effects because they remind me of close encounters it's just a lot of wandering lights and dark and the series got criticized a lot for that you can't see what's going on what's well, the bottom of the ocean so you know it made perfect sense to me that all you would see is lights and it just added which, to the mystery which part of the design of the whiskers the things that floated around the ship right. they had those lights and beacons Part of that was to illuminate the places when they went deep, deep into the ocean. Um, so you could actually see the ship. Yeah, um, again, all the concepts are terrific. All of them, they're all well thought out. Ah, there they are. Um, there they are. There's, uh, this is Mechanical Darwin. <laughs> mechanical Darwin. Uh, if you look behind me here, uh, the uniform that Roy is wearing, that's the actual uniform. Uh, that's Roy Shard's actual costume from season one. Oh, uh, wow. Now, yeah, where did you uh, get that? And uh, I got well, <laughs> where did you get that and how much did you pay? Well, let me tell you a little story here, because when I went out to Florida the first time, gosh, 20 okay. years ago. We'll come back to this. Hold on. OK. And OK, go. They uh, there was a kind of like a sci fi shop there called Sci Fi World, I think it was. And you've got, to, you've got to think about the fact that in the UK, comic shops are very few and far between. We don't have that kind of a culture here. And so when I went to this, uh, this sci-fi world in Orlando, they actually had screen-worn uniforms. There's, they had a UEO uh, officer's uniform just hanging there, just, you know, at retail, ready to buy. And I remember my, my fiancé just holding this thing up. I don't know how she even knew it was from Secrets, but she says, what about this? 
And I nearly fell over because I was like, that's a Screen News piece. It meant nothing <laughs> to her, but so it was like a race to the till. And, you know, afterwards it became apparent that everything from Sequest, absolutely everything from the clothes to the props to everything else were auctioned off in a huge one day auction. Uh, I can't remember what it was now, but, um, and everything went, everything was sold and it's all over the world to, uh, to find, to pursue. But, um, but, but how much, how much was it? Uh, it was pretty reasonable actually, um, considering its pedigree and considering I got it from somebody that actually worked on the show. Um, I paid, oh gosh, I paid about 700 pounds for it. So what's that about, uh, 1,000, 1,200 US dollars. Wow. And it'd be worth a, this is a while ago, bear in mind. Bearing in mind, if you look at it as well, it's the, um, it's what the year? white turtleneck. What year? what year? How long ago to buy it? Oh God, maybe five, six years ago. Oh, you had it five, um, six years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, until that point, it had been in uh, this guy's basement. He just left it there. So you went, you went in 2015, you went to Florida to A, I believe, visit a museum. And then you found this in a comic book store? No, 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 no. No, the first encounter I had with a, with a screen used item was in a, in a sci-fi store. That was, that was like a decade or, or, or more before. Then the Sequest Museum, I went on the second time that I went out to Florida. And this, uh, this uniform, after I started serious collecting with the, with the costumes, this only came into my position about five years back. So, um, Wow, okay, and, and I've got you full screen now. So you said, what about the collar? Something about the collar? So the color is, well, the color is kind of what um, is the defining feature because a lot of the time with, with sci-fi costumes and props, I'm sure you'll know they're in such appalling state. They're only thrown together just so they can appear on screen for brief moments and then discarded. Um, on the color of uh, Roy suits uh, is an embroidered captain's uh, symbols, like two sets of tridents. And you can see the stitching on the inside of the color. You can see the trident as in the inside of the color. And when I was watching the show, I was always kind of like, why do they put a patch inside the color as well as the outside? And it turns out it's not, it's just the embroidery. And so little tales like that, are what uh, kind of, signifies something is genuine that and the fact his name's in it he's got roy written in biro in, in the uh, tag in the back i mean oh, it doesn't wow. get better does it doesn't get better than that does it oh wow okay oh okay let me just ponder that a moment no, just kidding um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. it turns out i mean he, he's um the other thing about this particular suit and roy's uh jumpsuits entirely uh, is that uh, the rest of the cast were all given black, uh, I think they're Nomex flight suits, patches stitched on, uh, just basically sized. Roy's were all custom made. Um, the guy who uh, sources for me said that all these were custom made, tailored to fit him and were completely different than anybody else's on the show. He was not a big guy. I mean, he was like, he was like 5'10", 32 waist, really kind of slender, lithe. And, you know, when you look at the uniform, it seems very small, but uh, yeah, that's Hollywood. Now you can you fit into it or no? No, <laughs> God, I wish there are some. Uh, I've got uh, some season two uh, sea suits uh, that I fit in, and a lot of the UEO stuff I fit in. Um, wow! But once I okay. try them, I never do it again. Once um, what we got up on the screen right now that people are looking at are the patches that go on the uniforms or the hat because that winds on the hat. Uh, yes. We talked about the hammerhead shark there. Uh, yes. DSV stands for Deep Submergence Vehicle. A lot of people didn't know that. Um, and then the 4600 was the class of the ship, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. UEO and then uh, tell us about UEO. So uh, that's that's fun in the pilot, actually, because when uh, when Captain Bridger is under pressure to remember who he's actually working for, he can't remember. <laughs> it's uh, the United Earth Oceans Organization. Isn't it just United Earth Organization? United Earth Oceans Organization. Oh, really? How come there's not two O's then? Well, you asked the question. <laughs> yeah, okay. And of right. course, the symbol of the sea seems to be pretty common, the trident, uh, King yes. Trident. So, yeah. And uh, the globe behind it. And of course, the what do they call those? The little eggs? The um... Yeah, they call them scrambled eggs when you buy them on caps, aren't they? I'm not yeah. sure what's over, over here, yeah. Okay, now, I mentioned this a little bit ago. I had this, I had the Nintendo, I had the, the Sega, I had the, the, uh, what's it, the little guy. It's the one. Um... Game Boy. Anyway, what's that? Yeah, yes. Game Boy. Yes, 
this was a this was the graphics were I hate to say it were sad. The game yeah. was kind of fun if you could get through some of the levels and so on and so forth. Um, the graphics of the the submersion vehicles were were kind of weird, um, yeah. but it was the technology of the time. I'd love yeah. this game to come back out, but in today's technology. So, well, in the meantime, um, I've actually got. If you go to my site, I've got a version of it you can play online. Um, I can't really? remember the site it's from. Yeah, there's just a, we'll just a it. link to it. We'll get it. We'll get there. Okay. Yeah. How about? Uh, oh, check it out. Oh, uh, you have all of them. Oh, do I have all of them? Do I ever? Um, actually, all these pictures, all these pictures of the figures, uh, I took all of those. They're all mine. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I don't know whether you knew that or not, but yeah. I, I have built no that. idea. I, yeah. found, I was looking for action figures to do the... Uh, I did a Sequest show um, in my uh, my other show uh, called uh, Comments and uh, Reviews and Opinions. Um, and I wanted to show the action figures, but not you know individually. And I, yeah. I, just, I just typed them in and these came up. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, I built that diorama behind them and just just shut them against them. Um, yeah, these for their time, these things were amazing. These were made by Playmates, the same people that were responsible for uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Star Trek: The Next Generation. That was the most famous figure line, their most successful figure line. Um, but these were a step up from the next gen figures, I thought, because uh, they were designed by a company called Varna Studios, and Varna Studios were mad keen to give all the figures. Uh, enough articulation so they could go into the vehicles. There you go. There you go. Aren't they fabulous? They are. Even, even the stands. I mean, uh, let me take yep. uh, let me take Mr. Schneider off. Um, yep. Come with the uh, the logo. Yep. And the name, and then on the back. Yeah. They don't. Styling make, was terrific. They don't make toys like this anymore. No, not at all. And the uh, the sculpts, the um, the likenesses to the actors, better than uh, I, I think they're better than most contemporary action figure lines. Actually, yeah. Uh, now that you say that, let me see. Yeah. Um, uh, let me bring. Okay, I'll bring nice and close. Let me get a focus. One, two, three. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. That's Roy Scheider. Yeah, I mean, to do a broken nose in that kind of scale must have been really challenging, but they, they <laughs> managed. <laughs> Yeah, this is before they. Oh, actually, no, they did the the laser thing. They take the actor into a booth and they laser imagery. Were they uh, laser scanned? What's that? Ah, I didn't realize they were laser scanned. That would explain. Oh a great yeah, deal. all the next generation cast. They got. They got. They. They'll tell you if you look at some of the behind the scenes. They'll tell you about how you know oh, they worried right. about their butt and all this other stuff because they're well, they're pretty accurate. It's a concern. <laughs> All right. Um, where were we? We were action figures that I had no idea were yours. Do you still have that diorama? No, I threw that. I just built it to take the shots, and I just I, I, I binned it straight afterwards. I didn't think I'd ever use it. Again. I wish I'd have kept it now. <laughs> I wish you'd send it to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I could. I could have sent it to you. No problem. Here's the uh, plaque that was on board the vessel. Um, couldn't tell you where it was because it moved around like two or three times. But um, yeah. This, this is my neck of the woods. This is Hollywood, California, uh, Universal Studios, literally Universal City, which has its its, its own city now, or has been, um, where the soundstage where they actually had the the Sequest, uh, the Sequest, all the yeah. Sequest sets, so including the water and all this other stuff, um, and they uh, they really promoted it here in America. You said they didn't yeah. in UK. No, no, it's um, the series itself was 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 neglected horribly. I would have I just back in the day, I would have just absolutely died to have seen that. That would have been, I mean, just the sign and the doors alone would have been enough to keep yeah. me going for days. But I mean, you know, to 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 know that just behind those doors that you know the series was shot, amazing. Yeah. Um, now you can talk. Whoops, what too far? You can talk about this. So, um, yeah, tell us. Um, so this is the uh, the, uh, the front page of my uh, site Sequest Vault. Um, back in uh, back in the day, I don't know how long you've been. I mean, obviously, you're a huge fan yourself. So I don't know if you remember that there was a group. The only existing trace of Sequest online used to be a, a message board called New Cape Quest. Um, that was a lot of fun for a while, but then it just evaporated. You were never to be seen again. And uh, the year was 2018, and I was you know a huge fan. Uh, but kind of like, you know, in a position where I was, you know, I could actually do something about it. I was like, well, what better year than 2018 
you know, where the, where the, when the series was supposedly set to kick off an all encompassing website. Now, the idea of, of the vault, literally, as the name suggests, was is that everything goes in there. Now, when I mean everything, I wanted to kind of provide the uh, even the, ca the most casual viewer with the experience of actually being as close to being in the show as possible. I've been so lucky in terms of a lot of people from the show uh, who worked on the show have been in touch. I've managed to interview them. Um, I've not got to cast yet. Cast is coming, but I've done. A, uh, I've interviewed a lot of behind the scenes people. Uh, the costume designer um, Ingrid Price. She was wonderful. She gave me all kinds of info. Um, there's a chap called Mark Bradley who worked on all the graphics. He's been terrific as well. And so if you click through the, um, all the options at the top, there's a, the most comprehensive yeah. review. We're going to get, we're going to get to your website. So this is just an image of, of, I was hoping you more talk about the background here because oh. it's going it's to show up. It's going to show up in another picture, but <laughs> now that, now that you brought it up, <laughs> I want to. I want to ask you. Do you think you still in touch with any of those behind the scenes people or cast? Do you think yes. they would want to do my show? Absolutely. I. I think that, um, that most people involved with it are kind of at the stage now where it's kind of like, it's like most genre projects. They they go around and they and they come back. They have their moment again and they have their resurgence. And that's what I've tried to capture here. And everybody that I've spoken to that did work on the show is fiercely proud of being involved with it. F fiercely proud of the work that they managed to uh, achieve because yeah. it, it was so forward thinking. Because you know, a referral always actually helps a little bit for somebody to follow through. So uh -huh. can you maybe put in a good word and say I've got this thing called the Geek Authority Show and. I will do one show for you know for anybody you send me. Um, well, this will this will go both on the website and I'll also put it on our Facebook uh, page beneath the surface. So okay. uh, and the cast. Now that you said that, now yes. that you said that, okay. I'm, here's my appeal. So any cast crew, anybody from Sequest, <laughs> love to have you on. Um, thanks to Martin, um, his website. We connected by accident because I just did a Google looking for people interested in Sequest and I found him or his site. And then um, he took a little time to get back to me, but <laughs> finally he got back to me. And uh, um, okay, wait, let's go back. So yeah. Um, well, this is um, this is one of uh, many uh, schematics. This is done by an artist called Frederick Barr, who back in the day was given an assignment to uh, do. Uh, Universal were going to publish another book about Sequest. There's one already. Um, there was only published in the UK, the official guide to the series. I don't know if you've got that. You've got that. Yes. You... This is I, this is the the only publication I've ever known. The only publication. Existed. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But but it says on top it says and seen on TV, and then on the back it says Box Tree Limited, Broadwell, Twenty One Broadwell, London. Yeah. Um, the official publication of the series, Louis Shunovic. Thank you. <laughs> like, I didn't want to butcher that name. Um, but I, I got this, like, I don't know how I got this. This was many years ago. And um, it's literally the, you know, the, the glued edge, edges are like falling apart. But this has yep. been my Bible um, yep. regarding behind the series. And just so you know, it's got graphics and illustrations. It's got interviews with all of the cast, pretty much. Yeah. Um, am I going too fast? Can you see anything? No, no, that's good. It was yeah. only ever published in England. Only ever published Hi. in the UK. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just said, considering how appallingly they treated the series when it was here, why we should be gifted with such a fabulous book. I'm just grateful either way. I, came, I remember coming across that in the bookshelf and going, oh, my God. I'll take one of those. And yeah, um, all these guys in the States, they had no idea the thing existed. I mean, obviously they do now, but uh, yeah, I mean, that is the Bible, really. I mean, the um, it's a perfect little time capsule, that book. Right, and it talks about like this picture here. This is the uh, navigation, I believe, or the helm. I don't know, one of the two. Uh, yeah, chairs I think, that they sat in. Yeah, I think that's one of the Cobra chairs that uh, James Lieben designed. I mean, again, just look at that. Just fantastic. Apparently, they're very uncomfortable to sit in. That picture is from, uh, if you look in front of it, you can see the broken down flats from all the sets. That picture is from the auction. That's when wow. they sat there ready to be sold. Can you, can you imagine? Just to get rid of them like that. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because I was just watching a recent documentary that Shatner, William Shatner, did on the captains. Um, and one of the interviews was with Robert Picardo, who played the doctor among other millions of rows. 
um, he talked about the last day of shooting Voyager, and it was a one shot, one deal, real quick with Janeway. Nobody else was there. She did her line, whatever. And uh, as she, as they yelled, "Cut! Check the gate! Print it!" They were tearing down the set around her. Literally, really? she hadn't even got out of costume yet or off the set. Um, and I guess that's how they do it now. It's like seven years on that show. Mm-hmm. I wish Sequest went seven years, but anyway. Oh, uh, it should have. With, no with, Roy. About it. with Roy. With Roy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They should have. Uh, okay. Uh, there's, all kind, there's all kinds of scenarios you could think of, really. But I mean, when you look at shows these days where captains come and go and, you know, it, it's all kind of out there. You know, Roy could so easily have returned for a season four. But, you know, give the give the guy what he wanted. You know, how hard could it have possibly been? The, you know, the premise behind season two didn't work. You tried again with season three and that didn't really deliver either. So, you know, listen to what the man's got to say about which direction the series should have gone in. And you'll probably find that he was right. Yeah. Um, no one knows their characters more than the actors who portray them, uh, along yeah. with the writers. So, but um, what did you think of the design of the sequest? With the living Un- skin and the... Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, what a concept to have a, uh, a, a thousand foot long Swiss army knife, as Bridget described it, covered in uh, a, a bio skin that basically uh, sealed or healed every time that it was struck with uh, with something from the outside. I mean, well, what a genius concept. I mean, it's and it, again, it's beautiful to look at. Again, uh, I can't credit James Lima enough for, for coming up with this because, you know, I don't know what he was thinking other than other than squid. I mean, you can tell by the the nose alone that it's based on. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's complete. It looks biologic rather than uh, transportation. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah. The whole the whole layout. I mean, the stuff that they did inside with the maglev and stuff like that. That was genius too. Loved all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, let's zoom this in a little. Um, is this one of the same that artist you were talking yeah. about? Yeah, that's Showing another. The under the patron Frederick Barr's art. Um, apparently, um, the publishers weren't looking for a, a technical manual like the Star Trek ones. They wanted something you know that was more cast based, and so they rejected it. Can you believe they rejected this this fantastic art that he did for it? He did pages and pages of it. Okay, so now let's uh, let's delve into a little more of you with your yeah. your. Oh, where is it? Ta da! This is your actual website. So, right now, guide guide us guide us through it. What should what should we look at? Where should we go? So, um, I should probably thank. Uh, there's a, a designer out there called Chris Kuhn. He's responsible for doing this fabulous uh, this fabulous layout for me. Um, and as you can see, that's uh, New Cape Quest or uh, what was pretending to be New Cape Quest back in the day, which is actually St. Pete's Pier or the former St. Pete's Pier in Florida. Um, I think about. I think I'm probably most upset to this day that they they tore that down. That that uh, triangular building in front is what they used uh, for a great deal of the season two uh, scenery, uh, especially the beginning. The the pilot for season two that features predominantly, and uh, obviously it's a real building and they tore it down um, recently and rebuilt it. it. Looks nothing like that now, um, but yeah, uh, in the site. Um, I have posts on the first page. And what I've tried to do is I've tried to document everything in kind of sequence. So I've kind of started at the very beginning with interviews with people, the creators like Rockney S. O'Bannon. Um, and then I've moved gently on to the designers. Um, and then because it was Roy's birthday recently, I just put this little, uh, this tribute up to him because this is this interview takes place just before he got the call to uh, join Sequest. Um, I don't know if many people out there realize that uh, the working title for Sequest DSV was Deep Space. That's what the, the show was going to be called. And uh, there was concern from Universal that uh, it already sounded a bit too much like Deep Space Nine. And so to have two things that sounded similar to that, that was kind of like too much. And so they changed it to last minute to Sequest, um, which of course is the best title. Right. Did you like the transfers they did for the Blu-ray? Um... I uh, I own the German set. Um, I can't remember who released it now, um, but the German set is absolutely terrific. The uh, the transfers are, are superb. Because um, some... in, in America, the ones we got, the opening titles, everything's pixelated until it gets into the show. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird looking. 
Um, I don't think that's the case with the with the releases that I've got. I don't think that's the case at all. I is the German one good. in German or English? No, it's in English. You can um, the options are there. I mean, it's German insofar as all the titles and everything are German, but uh, you can. Um, it's uh, it's all of the original soundtrack. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's the link for the game. Uh, if anybody's interested in playing it, you click that and uh, you straight back to the uh, the Super NES version of it. Uh, let's let's check it out. I hope the link works now, otherwise that's going to be embarrassing. Oh, there we go. <laughs> ah, good. And this is the actual game, or what is it? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. I've played it a few times, so, and I'm absolutely hopeless with it. You know, I'd, I'd get my, I'd get my lad up here if I, uh, if I'm going to play games, he can figure these things out better than I can. I sound really, really old now, but it may take a lot of. Oh, oh yeah, I remember the graphics. Not that much time. I... Yeah. So yeah, it's still out there and it's still playable. Okay. All right, I'm gonna come back. So yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> So, right. as, as, so the, as the vault, okay. as the vault, it's all there in one place. Um, mission. mission is is about me. Uh, it's about. Ooh, look um, at this stud. Oh, oh. <laughs> when was that taken? Oh God, that's twenty years easily. Um, that's me outside. What I've just been uh, talking about the old uh, St. Pete's Pier. And we discovered that completely by accident. Uh, my dad was taking us out on a drive just to, uh, you know, take in some scenery in, uh, in Florida. And we drove past it. And of course, I instantly recognized it. I had no idea where it was in reality or whether it even was reality. Um, so when I saw that, I just completely lost my mind. And we spent the rest of the day there. And that was uh, that from that day forth, that kind of solidified my, my fandom with Sequest because that made it real to me because it's like, well, well, there's UEO headquarters. It actually exists. It's actually standing. I mean, the fact the boat isn't here, you know, so what? You know, there's the, there's the ocean. There's UEO. I'm right in the middle of this. This is, it's fab, it's fabulous. It's, it's like, you know, I can only explain it as the equivalent of like, you know, going into space and seeing Enterprise in dry dock or something. You know, it's, it's a silly little thing, but it had a really big effect on me. And from that point on, I was kind of like, well, this is my thing now. Because, you know, Sequest, for anybody that uh, has a really a passing interest, it's, it didn't catch on the way that everybody thought it would. It wasn't as huge as it should have been. So it's kind of niche. And I kind of like the fact that the fans that, that do like it, they love it. And it's theirs. I mean, it belongs to us now. I mean, it, you know, we're 20, 20, more than 20 years down the line now. And so we can kind of claim ownership of it because, you know, we celebrate it. Therefore, it kind of belongs to us. It's not like Trek, which is a massive ongoing thing. and will probably uh -oh. go on forever and ever. Uh-oh. Oh, well. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. There is a, a kind of a reticence for people to help me out with that. Uh-oh. Um, my, uh, I have a great uh, reviewer called uh, Charles Mento, and I think he's already done the reviews for 2032. I just haven't published them yet, but I'll get around to them. Oh, yeah, same season two. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, but if you go to episodes, if you go to season one. No, I did. I just did that. I was, while you were talking, I was scrolling through it. You'll find that it's the most comprehensive episode guide online because it Including has PDFs of the script. PDFs of the original scripts plus uh, galleries uh, from uh, that have Blu-ray rips on them, so they're really high quality. You won't find that anywhere else on the web. I've been so lucky with people that have come forward to help me out with that. Um, there's a there's a guy in the states called Chris that that just fires these things over to me, and they've been wonderful. Um, but yes, these uh, these are the image galleries. I work really hard to kind of because all these images are like you know some of them are really kind of pixelated and old and I kind of sourced the very best that were out there. A lot of them are slides from my own collection that I've scanned up. Um, a lot of them have you been mean, contributed by the fans. You mean film slides? Wow. Yep. Yep. All 35 mil slides that I've uh, that I've scanned up because I, you know, I didn't want to do a site that was kind of uh, rough or cheap looking. I wanted the best of the best because it's the vault. It's the, it's the place where everything sequest is going to end up hopefully. Uh, what you're looking at here is my old friend, God rest his soul. This is John Kachmar. This is uh, the owner or former owner of the Sequest Museum. Um, and that's his collection there or part of his collection. John was fortunate enough to um, purchase many of the costumes. That's his lovely wife, Diane. Um, John purchased many of the costumes from the auction, uh, looked after them. Um, 
and uh, when I visited in the year 2000, <laughs> which just yeah. reminds me, uh, you can see my little tour of it. Um, wow. Sadly, uh, this collection has been broken up now. Where, oh, so it's, uh, that was my next question. Is it still together? Yeah. Where is it? No, no, no. Um, it is in the hands, the vast majority of it is in the hands of another collector uh, who's got it in storage. Um, and he's, he's quite a famous uh, Star Trek uh, aficionado. Um, and I don't think he really knows what to do with everything he's got here. And I keep encouraging him to say, you know, let's get this stuff out there because, you know, time is going on and, you know, people deserve to see it. Um, so, you know. Uh-oh, uh-oh. What's that? Oh, prop locker. Oh, that's another work in progress. A lot of this, um, the Playmates Toys is a good link. That's all done. Um, because it's all completely ongoing. The, you know, I'm overwhelmed with stuff that I'm trying to get done with it. The prop locker is going to be an immense page. Uh, this is the taken directly from the Playmates catalog from 1994. This is their presentation. Um, and these are the figures. Those are the prototypes that were shown at Toy Fair in 94. I see Picard and... <laughs> yep. Yeah. And so there's, when you read these, when you read the, uh, the publicity behind him, it's so sad. What they, they had huge things planned for this show. Absolutely huge. There was going to be an exhibit at one of the parks. Universal were going to have a Sequest ride. Um, that would have been... And it was going to be... Wouldn't that have been something... Um, and it was ongoing, you know, and, uh, but instead they cancelled the line after nine figures, nine of the best figures in, in ever, ever offered. And they, they stopped it dead after uh, nine releases. Westphalia was going to be up. next. Uh, <laughs> that cracked me up. That's Ted Raimi holding his own action. Ted Raimi. Yep. Yeah. I still love to meet him one day and get my, get my one signed by him because he's, he's quite a character. Oh, he um, and he's he's uh, he's still very forthcoming about the show. He's he's he's. Uh, I, I saw um, an interview with him recently, and uh, he he loves talking about it. Apparently, twenty thirty two was his favorite season as well. Really, he yeah, got to do know? one actually. Hmm. You know, they they shortened the cast, so all the uh, cast members got to do more. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, yeah, here finally, we are on Facebook. Yeah. So this is uh, kind of. Uh, I was lucky enough to be taken on as an admin for this group. This group's been around for a long time, but we, uh, we kind of, I would, there's a, it's run by a fellow called CJ and I asked him if I could join up. And since then we've kind of gone wild trying to update it and everything. And um, what we've, the most recent change that we've made is that uh, we've managed to get in touch with cast members, the people that worked on the show that I knew, they've all joined up. And now we've got this little facility where we can, uh, you can actually ask them questions directly. Um, if you have something that's on your mind about the show, uh, we've had Don Franklin taking part. We've had Marco Sanchez taking part. He's a fabulous guy. Um, and, you know, to this day, all of these guys are still really keen to put across their, their memories of it. I mean, they, they, they remember it very, very fondly. Um, there are other Sequest groups uh, on Facebook, but um, we're really proud of this one. It's really taken off. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's going to be much more to come. Wow. I don't know. Did you notice I had changed my background here? I did. That's, that's <laughs> I don't want to make of any of that. But <laughs> well, your website's up there so people can uh, go to it. Um, but yeah, I don't think I did show this yet. I've got to show. Um, um, there we go. All right. <clears throat> now, I didn't just catch this till today, but check out his watch. He's got a Sequest DSB watch. Yep. And that's. Um, that was a crew gift. Those watches were only given to cast and crew for first season. Um, so they're incredibly rare. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough because, you know, I've just put myself out there as somebody that is wild for this stuff. And, you know, it's, it's nice that people actually come to me now and say, I've got this, you're interested. And I'm like, well, hell yeah. I mean, it's in fabulous <laughs> condition as well. So I'm really happy with that. And Okay. What do we got going here? That is another gift that came directly from Ingrid Price, the costume designer herself. She was just, she was so nice. Uh, I couldn't, uh, she was so forthcoming with, uh, you know, anything I had to ask. And she gifted me one of these t-shirts. This is a, a Dagwood t-shirt. Um, the reference there, the HAC stands for Hollywood Athletic Club. Um, and it's got uh, Gelf 
references from daggers and such like. And the, uh, the, the HAC was some kind of in joke with the cast and crew of Sequest. And they, I've not been able to get to the bottom of it yet. I will. I'm going to find out what, what it's all about. But uh, there's a terrific shot of the, um, the season two crew. And they're all wearing these T-shirts. So it's got some kind of cosmic significance. I just don't know what yet. Okay. This is the this is just a regular oh. wetsuit by the company that made their <laughs> wetsuits. Yeah, this is a, it's just an O'Neill t-shirt. This is actually, I think, uh, I'm on my honeymoon here, I think. It's just to show that I've always had kind of a, a, a strange obsession with the ocean. I just find it. Really? Where's the honeymoon? Where is it? That is, uh, that's the med behind me. I'm actually on the island of Mallorca there. That's where uh, we went on our honeymoon years ago. Um, wow. Yeah, and, uh, you know, always hey. happy there. Hey. I've got one of those. You've got one of yeah. those. I've got one of yeah. those. That's actually, that came from one of the directors, I think. Really? Cap. Yeah, set use cap. Now, where's um, the sequest? What'd you do with her? I know. <laughs> I know. So, so well, you know. What year? what year is this? Gosh, maybe, maybe 2004, something like that. I'd guess. Wow. Something and like you're that. Saying, you're saying this building no, is no longer there? It's gone now, yeah. They rebuilt it only, uh, I think only last year it reopened and it's kind of a, a very kind of abstract, arty kind of building now. I mean, the reason that they, uh, the producers settled on this area is because that's a very futuristic looking building. So why you turn it down, tear it down in favor of something else? Beats a, lot of their, a, lot of, a lot of their locations on the series had pretty modern buildings they used, so. They, uh, um, they made the best of the environment. I don't think they made enough of the environment, actually. I think with the, I think they made use of the Living Seas exhibit at SeaWorld. They, the UBO office building, I think, was the was Florida Power. Um, mm -hmm. But this, this is the building that, that featured most predominantly of all. And of course, as soon as I'm there, I'm looking where you know Roy parks his motorbike up and where he looks out across to see where the boat is, and looking back at the beach um, yep. where uh, where Lucas uh, is uh, on that. Uh, Jet bike. Yeah, that's what you're wearing now, right? No, you're yeah. wearing a black one. That's a blue. Yeah. That looks blue. No. That's black. Yeah. Same okay. t-shirt. Same t-shirt. All right. Yeah. Now, my favorite. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> now, the jumpsuit. Where'd you get the jumpsuit? So the jumpsuit, uh, the season two sea suit, is another original screen used piece. Um, I had to source. You see the buckles on the shoulders. Yeah, um, they didn't come with it. I had to source those from the original maker, um, and yeah, that it was a squeeze to get into that. But yeah, I was I was happy that uh, I'd finally got the uniform because that was my favorite uniform from the show. Uh, Why I've got the Why season two versus season one? Oh, I think it was because the season one uniforms were kind of criticized for the fact that they were kind of formless and shapeless and just kind of like, you know, I think they were described as potato sacks by some nasty critic or other. So I think that they kind of went back and they made it a bit more, I mean, again, Ingrid Price who designed them, she was hell bent on giving all the cast members shoulders. So she padded their shoulders. Then she brought waists in by putting that, those, uh, uh, those belts on in the middle. I just thought it was just more, uh, if, um, if she's to believe to be believed, uh, so, according to is Roy's jumpsuit behind you different from season two? Is that is that? Oh yeah, com totally, com they're completely different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, I like the black ones from season. Yeah. Oh yeah, the I black like, ones like from season one. one. Yeah, flight suits, um, but the season two suits were completely custom designed. They were they were completely uh, original. Wow. Mm. Okay, so I tell you, the website's amazing. Um, I'm going to check out the Thank script you. too. I didn't realize until now that I saw the PDFs for the scripts because I'm, I'm a big yep. script person. So um, there are, very there cool. are alternate versions there as well. There are alternate versions. Uh, check out the one that's the, the first draft of The Stinger. It's a completely different episode than the one that was released. Much better, in my opinion. Meaning the original story and they rewrote it? Yep. Wow. Yeah, yeah they, I don't know if you heard, but they did that with like Star Trek City on the Edge of Forever, Harlan Ellison's. His right. actual version is so different from what they actually used. Really? So, yeah, and there's a book. He wrote a book giving you both versions and how he broke it down. It's really cool. Um, okay, <clears throat> now here's an ultimate question. 
no one, <clears throat> okay, somebody's watching this. They're like, ooh, this is cool technology. You know, Roy Scheider, you know, science fiction. Why should someone watch this show? Either go research the DVD, buy it and check it out. Or I don't, I don't think it's on streaming anywhere. So I think the only place you can get it. But why should someone check the show out? Well, until recently in the UK, it was being shown on the horror channel. And that's the first time since it's been broadcast on the sci-fi channel for years. And it did pick up quite the audience uh, this time around. And I think that, it, that it's enduring appeal is that it's when you watch it now, as opposed to maybe then, it, you, can, you can tell that it's Spielberg is all over it. I don't think it's all that apparent first time around, but when you watch it now, if you place it in the same canon as Spielberg's early work, so if you watch Close Encounters and you watch Jaws, and then you watch this, they're very natural kind of precursors to each other. And the other thing is, is that it's set, it's actually set in this time that we're living in right now. And I think it does an absolutely superb job of representing the future. Bearing in mind, this is 1994. It doesn't look anything like 1994. It looks current. And so if you knew nothing about Sequest DSV, you'd never heard of it, and you watched it, you could be fooled into thinking that it was a, it was a contemporary show, because, of course, now it is a contemporary show. Back then, it was, uh, I guess you call it a period piece now, set in the future, or what was going to be the future. And so imagine living in that time now. I mean, we're, I think by 2021, I think we're into second season territory. Um, and apart from all the silly sci-fi aspects of it, I mean, I think there's a there's an episode um, that uh, that deals with an alternate future where people can't have contact with anybody anymore. People can't have contact with each other. I think it's called playtime, and I think that uh, people only associate with each other through gaming and stuff like. That. I mean, how incredibly topical is that, considering the situation that we're in right now? So it was yeah, kind of forward thinking. There was there was a whole episode on a pandemic. Hello. A pandemic. <laughs> yeah. yes Hello. yes that's one of the best episodes actually from season one the um giving liberté where they uh they discover um uh, a spacecraft and they bring back uh, this canister that contains a virus and the crew get infected and have to isolate from each other it's <laughs> it sounds like you're making this up doesn't it it sounds like we're we're having a laugh here but that's exactly what so, happens and it's so i think it was actually art you can say this was uh was it art imitating life because it's happening right now? But but I think for me, I think I think for me the best part is the story driven stories. I think yeah. they're character driven. I think they're story driven. The technology is cool and whatnot, but if it yeah, if yeah. it doesn't have a purpose and it doesn't motivate the story or the characters, you know, yeah. Sequest for me, season one, mind you, yeah. Yeah. was was all I was looking for in a, in a it was Star Trek underwater for me. Yeah, it offers an optimistic view of the future that everybody can get behind that you kind of wish that things would, would turn out this way and at the very forefront of it you have somebody that, that's a captain of the ship who's like everybody's dad that you instantly trust it's a bit like Charlton Heston you know getting on an airplane you just know that you know we're going to come out of this all right because it's Shida and yeah. you know he he's he's the captain and everybody looks to him and he's he's got you know he's emotional and, he, and he's you know he, he feels things and he questions himself constantly and he always relies on his crew and, he's, and he relies on the talents of his crew around him to, to get them through every adventure. So it's, it's compelling as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned, uh, to me, I associate, associate the actor as like Tom Hanks. You know, in a Tom Hanks movie, you're, yeah. you're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go well. It, yeah. bad, bad things may happen, but it's somehow that the essence of the actor comes through. Um, and let's not forget, they had some pretty cool villains and bad guys. Yeah. And, and all that other stuff. We forgot to mention Charlie's Angels girl. Remember? She was a, the former captain of the Sequest. Yeah, Shelley Hack as Captain Marilyn Stark from the, from the opening, yeah. Uh, Shelley, yeah. Shelley Hack. Yeah, um, Shelley um, Hack. I remember when so, I showed it to, to my Michael here, he'd never seen Sequest. And yeah. she came on, she goes, and he goes, isn't that, isn't that from Charlie's Angels? I said, yep, that's her. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Anyway, so uh, any other words of wisdom to Sequest seekers out there? Just that, um, you know, if, even if you have the most passive interest in it, we're in a better position now than we ever have been to celebrate it. So if you, if you want to join the Facebook group, please have a look at the site. Please see what you've been missing. Um, go buy the show. Go buy the show on, on DVD. There's, uh, the soundtrack Blu -ray. apparently is... Blu-ray. Blu-ray. Go buy on Blu-ray. <laughs> 
the soundtrack sold incredibly well. So there is interest out there. Um, and it, it is a, a fascinating insight into uh, what the future uh, was anticipated to be. And I still think it's as legitimate now as it ever was. And it's an incredibly entertaining show. So go watch it. And topical. The subjects they cover are happening right now. Right now. So, <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Well, um, listen, Martin, I, this has been an amazing conversation. Um, obviously, we're geeking out over this. And sorry, <laughs> audience, if, if we're getting too into it. But I tell you, when, when, there's, when you find something you love and then you find someone else who loves it just as much, it's kind of like two kids in a candy store. It's like, oh, I got to sample yeah. everything. And yeah. uh, you by far passed my collection. I mean, I've got the, I've got the toys. I've got some of the, uh, you know, the, the props and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I did a show on Sequest. So you might want to catch that. There's, I show most of the stuff I have. Um, I saw that show. Yeah. And I, I, I just, saw the show. I'm, um, I would love a Viewmaster. Did they make yeah. a Viewmaster? No, they never did. No. There were so many licenses. In fact, if you're going to start collecting, I mean, if you're, if you're looking to collect Sequest, it's, it's, it's terrific because it's, it's kind of finite. It's not like Star Wars where you can, you're, you're never going to get everything that's out there, no matter how hard or how, how much money you throw at it. You can get everything out there that's Sequest. It is kind of finite. But the, the thrill is kind of in the chase of it because it's super rare now. Even I mean, this? you can get even, not so much that or the figures. <laughs> the figures are quite common. But everything else. And when you get into collecting stuff like um, stuff that was actually used, this is a book of continuity, Polaroids. Continuity? So oh, these would really? have been so yeah, the, the... all taken on the set and they're all one of a kind because they're just shot really quickly to determine what each actor is wearing. That's Mika from the Avalon episode. That's Shida from season two. Don Franklin, he's fabulous. He, he's kind of, uh, he's, he's the current representation for Sequest. He's, he's the man They should bring him back around. Ted. So this is a book of everything that they shot from scene to scene, just so they could recall what each actor was wearing so they wouldn't get lost with continuity. And they're all in here. This is one of my prized possessions because, you know, show me another one of these. Uh, That's I Mariah wear. the Dagger. You remember Mariah the Dagger? Oh, yeah. Uh, she's Kevin Sorbo's wife, Sam Jenkins, as she used to be, Sam Sorbo. She was fabulous. She's a really good actress in that. So there's that. So this is kind of the, the current stuff. Well, I say current. This is the actual. Now, you know, you know, you know, in today's world, they don't do Polaroids. You, you got Polaroids no. there. Yeah. yeah, it's all digital right. now with the phones and all that. So, so how, are you, how are you preserving that? They're, they're going to turn yellow and fade eventually. They're in uh, an album that's uh, an anti-fade album. They're preserved that way. So I've, I've done a bit of homework when it comes to preserving this kind of stuff. So Yeah, I would uh, put them in something airtight. Don't let the air. Oh it's, oh, it's in the bag. Make no mistake. <laughs> um, uniform patches I've got. These are actual ones. Uh, name tags. Um, and kind of to top it off, the first prop I bought um, is this. Folks might recognize this as the uh, Pulse Gun, season two and three Pulse Gun. Um, this is a stunt one. This uh, non-functioning, so it doesn't have any of the fancy lights or anything like that. But uh, so this would have been like the equivalent of like a, I think they call them holster stuffers in the industry, just to be worn, to be knocked around. But having said that, it's still in fabulous condition, still has the uh, auction tag um, wow. out there. So, and uh, again, it comes with the, uh, with the holster as well. So, you know, this has been a very long pursuit for me. I've been doing this since the show ended. So that's what, 20 plus years. Um, but it's still out there. People are not really aware of the, or don't really attribute much value to this kind of stuff because, you know, it's, it's considered to be held by most as kind of like a forgotten kind of series. But, you know, if they don't want it, I'm more than more than happy to take care of it for them. Um, um, me too. Me too. You too. Oh. You too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Like I said, Martin, this was amazing. Thank you so much for doing this. This is likewise. Pleasure. This is educational. This is fun. This is this is. I got all. I got out my action figures for you and, and my gun. And <laughs> like, I forgot the book though. I, I couldn't believe that. Um, 
I didn't realize it wasn't published anymore. I, I was thinking you still guys, you guys had it up, but um, no, no, wow. no. It was, um, yeah, as I say, because uh, I mean, it's a UK publication to coincide with ITV screening of it, and ITV made a horrible mess of uh, the scheduling with it. So, uh, yeah, I, we're just lucky to have it because there's info and pictures in that book you won't find anywhere else. Yeah, the interviews alone are fascinating. Mm. Oh, yeah. But anyway. Thank you again once for doing this, um, uh, Martin. Uh, his website, you saw where to go. It's, it's also right behind me. I've got some links he sent me. I'm going to put them below. So make sure you subscribe to uh, my YouTube channel. Um, there's a little bell. You click that. And uh, when you do that, anytime I drop a video, it'll send you an email. You can watch it whenever you have the time or want to. Um, check out my other shows. I have the Talk About show where I talk about things like Space 1999. And uh, we did a show on Cobra Kai. We did a show on uh, Disneyland, um, the fact that it's been closed for 10 months. A uh, really emotional show, very cool. People bring out their stuff. Also, I have uh, the show where uh, reviews, comments, and opinions. That's where I talk about various things. That's where you see my, my episode on Sequest, where I talk about how wonderful the show is, um, mm -hmm. as well as um, the uh, um, unboxing of the Big Geek Authority. I open stuff up for the first time, and you and me see it for the first time as well as the Mysterious Changer, Chamber of Collectibles, where I pull out my out of my closet and under my bed all the stuff that I've been collecting since years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, it's true. Um, so again, uh, thanks for watching, and um, you know, don't forget to subscribe. And this has been a wonderful time, Martin. I can't thank you enough. Did I say thank you? Did I say you thank did. you? did. Lorenzo, <laughs> right back at you. This has been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. Absolute pleasure. So let's... Let's say bye to everybody and uh, have a great one. Thank you. See you Thanks next bye. time from the UK and America. Hey, I never did that before. Bye-bye. <laughs>